Boom. Testing. One, two, three. Yeah. All right. Here we go. chat up and I'm all set no idea how many people are in here yet uh, and I have to my first thing order of business here is to decide what to work on um, So, I have a lot of people in my viewer list, but no idea how many of them are actually here. Um, I want to move these up as possibilities. Instead of being in the not right now, because we've got enough going now that stuff like that becomes not implausible. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, I guess let me check Twitter. All right, and I guess actually while I'm waiting for people to show, we'll just run the game, quote unquote game. So one of the reasons why I mentioned that something like guns is feasible is because it would make it start to become more of a game. As would, you know, putting in an object system and stuff like that. And I should really smooth this stuff out and I probably want to turn off the third person camera. Yeah, smoothing the perspective would probably be good. Making your speed, yeah, that was an interesting thing. Making your speed be more plausible to the to a running speed, given the scale. Oh, look at how long it takes us to change. Oh, I guess that's because this was sort of, this is still the old flight model, just with collision uh, and forcing you to the ground. But the actual physics is still the the pseudo flight model that I used for creating the demo. So I probably should work on that too. Um, Twelve. Twelve viewers. Yeah, so let's get rid of the third person camera. Put that on a toggle. Um. This is not how you want to do it in the long run. Like, in the long run, the player object is an object, and it's part of the regular object rendering, and then you have to do a special check for, is it this particular player? Because we have multiple players. <clears throat> but, uh, for now, Let's just do it this way. Uh, and I have not started. This is me. This is my pre-stream work, just cleaning up the old states. We're not counting this as really starting yet. 
I mean, I'll still put it in the archive, but this isn't actually being rendered with voxels, right? Well, see, that's all a definitional thing. Uh, all that a voxel is, is you have pixels, which are points in 2D space that we have as a color, and we often treat them as little squares. You have texels that are very similar to pixels, and you have voxels. And so a voxel is just a bit of data in a 3D grid. And the bit of data that I have here is some solidity and some texture info rather than a color. Um, but there is, n in many senses of the word, it is still voxels. However, there is this whole contingent of people who are like, voxel rendering is when you have a 3D grid that you're, you know, in some way dynamically visiting, or for some people it has to be an ISO contours generated from a 3D grid or uh, something else. So yes, this is Minecraft style. That's why I call it a block game. OBBG is open block building game. Because there are people who get pissy about their terminology in a pretty much not actually supported way for what terminology really means. Uh, so now I want to support flying again. So how does this work? Physics move walkable. Is this still all allowing up and down angling? I think it is. So if not flying, then we do that. Else clear position x equals x. Point change that to capital. Uh, Anyway, so hopefully that meandering rant uh, answered your question. Uh, okay, and here we have the flying mode back, and it seems to feel about the same as it did. So you, one of the things this does is it smooths the rotation, although you can't tell because you're not controlling the rotation. And uh, now that I have a flying flag, let me put in a toggle for that. Uh, do I want a key that's more remote? That's okay. Really like that to be a control key, but I don't know SDL to do that instantly, so I'm not going to bother right now. Flying. So then, where do I smooth the rotation? Pending view Z and pending view. So if I'm flying, actually, let's just do this. If flying, we want this craziness. And if not flying, then let's just instantly update it. What? UX. How does any of this work? Because the. I think it's this. Ending view X. Seems like it's the wrong sign, though. Here, oops. I'm not sure what. Let's just move that whole thing in. And I think this just is that. We'll see if that's right.
shake your head. I actually kind of don't. Uh, okay, now my rotation is super spastic in the Z. So it might have a, some kind of weird feedback loop, but it's also just not being scaled. Um, and I'm not clamping it. Um, times like X is the one that was too much. Uh, but I can do this. All right, so uh, what? That's exact in both, whatever. Okay, now my X and Y. Yeah, this just needs to, I need to actually track through what the math is actually doing because this just feels terrible, but maybe it's just because I haven't scaled it correctly. Uh, where does this come from? Step right by it. Um, no, okay, it is just that. So it should just be this. So it's just a matter of getting these scale factors right. And it just feels there's something weird about it. It's weirdly jittery. Maybe I need to do a little smoothing mouse direction? That doesn't seem like it makes sense. Uh, it's interesting that my velocity doesn't actually follow that at all. Right, right, because that was the old flying physics, yes, where that was what I wanted it to do. Um, all right, so that's enough um, cleanup of the old state. So let's go ahead and tackle uh, a new task. So here's our task list. Um, is this is that font readable? I might have put it back down. I, I don't remember. Um, I might have set my font size back down. I think I had had to bump this up. Um, so when will this game have shadows? I think shadows is an important thing in a game. Well, it's a trade-off. Um, since one of the things that I'm doing here is trying to push as many triangles as possible for geometric complexity. So if I draw shadows, I start having to actually draw all the triangles twice, once for uh, the shadow map. And um, that's uh, uh, got to cut down on the the view radius. On the other hand, it's worth doing in the long run. Um, the open part of this is the idea that you could be steered towards different game designs, and so you could choose to have that or not. So that's really part of add better lighting that's down here. So then the question of when uh, is, of course, that there's no order for any of this thing. There is no um, and this is doing it in software rather than real shadows. Um, there is no roadmap here. Like, uh, I have no idea what to do, what order things are going to get done. So, font is fine. All right, well, if that's true and you're actually talking about the old font was fine, then I'm going to put it back. And then if it's too, too small, again, tell me. And I will bump it back up. Um, so, obviously there's tons and tons of stuff to do here. So, maybe let's categorize. So, look prettier. So, lighting, even the terrain stuff is. Dynamically set view distance kind of is. Uh... Right, better terrain, other terrain fixtures, better lighting, performance, 
Did I? Did any of those things? Were any of those things actually performance? Uh, this kind of is. So uh, let's call that performance, even though it's not really. Features. Um, let's call this voxel features. So this one is the actual voxel feature, and this is a feature we need to make that very particularly useful. Um, And then game features. So object system, object rendering, and physics is part of that. Raycast is part of that. Use more block types is part of, in some sense, look prettier. Shoot guns is a gameplay feature. Networking. Is a Minecraft feature, so we'll put it under voxel features. Um, just because it's not game, sp not game specific, it's not really gamey. It's just part of having the basic. Yeah, it's hard to. It's, you could argue it either way, but I'll just put it there for now. So, um. And you know the reason shoot guns is there is just because that makes it a little more distinct from Minecraft, even if that's not really that exciting a gameplay element. Um, so, networking is going to take a long time, uh, but it's pretty important. Uh, my friend Nick Vining was just posting about Star Citizen and commenting that you really have to put networking in from the beginning. If you don't put it in from the beginning, trying to retrofit it is a pain in the ass. Um, I think it won't be a, that bad if we don't put it in right away because I am always keeping in mind that it needs to be my network. So I have... Um, I try to avoid doing things in ways that will be unnetworkable, except to the extent that I do just put things in all the time where I'm like, well, this can't be this way in the long run, but that's how I'm doing it just for now. Uh, so there are some just for nows in the engine right now that are not how it needs to work when it's networking, which is part of why putting networking in even now will be a pain because yeah, those things have to get fixed. Um, so user block create destroy is obviously pretty big for looking like a Minecrafty thing. And the thing about that is I pretty much have to do disk save load of some kind for this because uh, while I could do this all by itself without any disk save load, not only does it not persist from run to run, but it doesn't persist if you just move away and come back. Um, you know, I'd have to re keep that data in memory and rebuild from it. And how much of that data can I keep in memory? Like it really wants to get flushed out to disk. Um, Let's see, so, but anyway, so I have a whole lot of look prettiers, and I've been working on those little bit here and there as we've been going, um, but they don't really matter to it being a game. Um, smooth camera height when stepping up. Fix walking physics. What do we have to fix in the walking physics? Um, we have to uh, a better handle pollution. Uh, don't stick to walls when falling to one block. Uh, and then push smoothly along walls, and then the physics core physics model sh 
should steer existing velocity, existing momentum to new direction instead of uh, being so Newtonian. Okay. Um, so those are the things I need to fix in what we, I was just, when I was just walking around just now, those were the things I, I saw that were pretty obvious and, you know, for this to feel any good, like, you know, if I wanted to make an alpha that people could play with, which, you know, it wouldn't even really be an alpha because it's not going to be much, really have to fix that. It's not ready for anyone to, to try to even stand in that world without that stuff being fixed. It feels terrible. And, you know, game feel... Having your character feel good when you move your character around is actually pretty huge, and it's you know, um, it's not just professional; it's like unplayable sort of when you don't do that right. So that definitely has to get fixed before anyone else tries to touch this. But uh, but we've been working on that recently, so I'd kind of like to do something else. Shooting guns really requires some objects out there, and it's probably more interesting if you're already multiplayer. I mean, I can make NPCs that you shoot at, but... So, that kind of implies that networking would have to get done before that. I think networking is going to be pretty boring, though. Um... So, I don't know. I don't know. If anyone in the chat has an opinion, I'm not going to take your opinion necessarily, but I'm interested in hearing your opinions if you have one. Um, let's see. Let make sure the bottom of this is visible. Okay. And... Do -do -do. Hmm. <laughs> Check for memory leaks is, of course, just sort of maintenance code quality. Um, are any of these really code quality? Smooth camera height when stepping up is kind of part of the fixed walking physics, but. Yeah, I'll go ahead and move that down, even though that can be seen as just looking prettier. I'm exciting to see networking on the land. Yeah, well, so the thing is, the whole thing won't get implemented today, but could certainly uh, take a stab at doing some of it. Um, I guess, yeah, why don't I go ahead and pretend I'm going to do networking and see... I'm just going to make a first pass and sort of think about what needs to get done, and I'll talk about it. And I'm just thinking to myself, so... Now, let me be clear. Oh, I should probably... Uh, is this shirt color okay? Yeah, I guess it's different enough from the black in the background. Um, I should probably be clear that I have not ever shipped a network game. So, uh, I, have I even gotten a network system? I don't think I've done a real-time network. Oh, I did one at... Did I get it? The actual thing working? I think I did. I think I did a little... Th toy thing at Looking Glass that didn't turn into a real game, but um, so I'm not uh, an expert at networking specifically, so both in the low level, like how I handle packets, and in the high level, like what the design for dealing with networking stuff, there's not necessarily going to be the ideal thing, uh, I'm going to be feeling my way as I go, I mean I've thought about it a lot, I know some of the standard practices, I have opinions about some of the standard practices, but those opinions have not been tested against reality, so uh, so yeah um, who said that so, sure, let's go ahead and start thinking about that. So, of course, one of the things I have to do here is uh, hopefully SDL has wrappers for the socket stuff. I mean, it's just sockets everywhere, so... Uh, but, you know, the syntax is a little different in 
windows from everywhere else, so... Uh, is this not a core, not part of core SDL then, I guess? It's a s separate thing. And do I only get SDL1 documentation? Probably. Uh, so... I really need to... Make a command shortcut that is, that I can get to all the time. Um, so, where do I keep my SDL libs? I don't even remember. Uh, no, tools, options. Oh, it's all the way back here now. Directories. I have it in here, app SDL2. Net. And why is it down multiple levels? SDL net, okay. So I already have it set up. So hopefully I can just link it. Lib, except I want to add this to release as well. And then I probably have to copy uh, so I have the does it how does it get the DLL? Do I have it on my path? Maybe I have it on my path. All right. Why this Windows version? Uh, this is Windows 7. I just have my have it set to a Windows Classic theme and I manually turn off the Windows gradients and this probably needs to go into the pack. Uh, Check my Twitter notifications. All right, so I can do the low level networking and then there's all the high level networking questions. So there's a few things to think about. Uh, one is uh, transmitting the map across. So one of the goals here is that if you're making a game with minimal building, um, then the client can just generate the map itself without you having to send it across the net, uh, which reduces the load on the server a lot because now the server only has to keep track of enough stuff for physics. It doesn't need to be able to send you the data you need to render out. Now, if you're making a game that's Minecraft-like where people are building lots of stuff all the time, that's not viable and you will have to send all the data across the wire and that's fine. Uh, and if you wanted to have something where you don't, you're making some game where you don't want people cheating and exploring more of the map than they can legitimately, then you don't want the, um, the physics, uh, you don't want the clients to be able to generate it, so you'd want to have a secret seed, and the clients, again, wouldn't generate the data, it would have to get sent to them. Um, you could do something where the map is the client can generate the map, but that doesn't include info about, you know, in Minecraft terms, it would be like uh, 
where the village is, villages are or where the um, strongholds are or things like that. So you might have two separate seeds, one for sort of the core map stuff and one for the sort of yeah, NPC, like you could call it like, I think of it in terms of traditional game design, you might think of it as like a map seed and a mission seed where the mission is also procedurally generated, all the, the stuff. And that would allow you to keep that stuff secret from the player while still letting them, while still offloading the, the problem of generating. Now, if you were thinking about optimizing this in terms of like how much power you're using globally, then you'd rather have the server generate it once and send it out to the clients probably, rather than have the clients regenerate it from scratch. But I don't think that's a valuable way to look at it probably. Uh, who knows how much power you're using transmitting that data, having to compress it and all that stuff. So it all depends on how efficient it is to generate. So anyway, so those are some of the things to think about for that side of things. Uh, as I said, like we have to think about this from both the high level and the low level. So I mean, I just set up the low level SDL, but the high level is sort of more interesting. So that's all down to like, what do we need to transmit? And depending on the game, you might also have a game that just has a fixed uh, fixed map, you know, like a, you know, a 2K by 2K map or something like that, and that will be nice for uh, physics. Like, if you wanted to make a game where you're just simulating everything all, all the time, everywhere, you, know, you just close off the world to a fixed size, and uh, you know, uh, rock on uh, and get rid of all the caches that I have currently for that kind of stuff. So uh, I want all those things to be supported. Um, and so I can, while implementing a new feature like networking, just pick one of those things and pick a sort of a simplified model. So for example, networking, I could have no transmitting any map data across to start with and just rely on the clients to generate it independently. Um, and then eventually that stuff needs to get added. So you know, when, then once you get to use your block create destroy, hey, you have to transmit the create destroy messages. But also when you have somebody who joins late, they need to find out about all of the previous create destroys. So, <clears throat> uh, so we'll see. We'll see how that stuff goes eventually. Um, so what we need to do, we now need to start thinking about everything in terms of client server where we didn't before. So. The biggest thing right now is that we are generating this data. We're actually currently storing our physics representation in the mesh stuff. And that's going to be bad with a server split. The server just wants to store the physics data independently. Mm -hmm. But the player does still want to have the physics rep as well. So. Uh, I mean, all that stuff's abstracted, as I've said before, so uh, probably this will be okay. So what do we want to do? We want, let's get a document up. Uh, let's just go ahead and say new text server.c location and source. So let's break this down. Server responsibility. Authoritative physics. Authoritative physics. Does it have to do anything else at this point? Client's responsibility. Um, predictive physics. Generate terrain for rendering. Generate terrain for physics. Yeah, so this is one of the things I was going to get at a second ago is that so we're going to split the client, the, the single player, single player 
needs to have both the server and the client running, and I'd like them to not have to redundantly generate the train, but that's going to be even grosser. Um, this is something that you know you don't have to worry about when you just have a fixed map. Um, you can even, if you want, have two copies of the map loaded, one for the server and one for the client, but I'm sure games don't I avoid doing that. Um, but here, like the what you're responsible for in physics with the server is it wants physics data around all the NPCs and all the players. And if it's if it's single player, you have only only one player, but they'll still be NPCs. If you want to simulate NPCs who are far away on the map, the server will need that. Meanwhile, the client only needs the physics for what it's doing the predictive rendering, which is or predictive physics for which is the stuff around the player. So there's going to be this weird thing where they want different physics terrain. Um, so there's a few ways to approach that. We can just not worry about it and have redundant copies of everything, although I'm running in 32-bit, so I memory pressure is actually kind of significant. Um, and we can uh, try to get that stuff right, or we can just kind of hack it. And as you know, my approach to these things is generally to hack it until I need it correct. Um, and, uh, and obviously convert generated train generated to meshes, render meshes, poll user input. Um, now, in the long run, uh, I think a server would have to be 64-bit. Or if it's only 32-bit, it would probably have a limited player count. And one of the things I'd like to do is push the player count a lot higher. Um, if you have a 64-bit server. In other words, make this fa fast and make this fast. So generating terrain, I'm always going to be keeping in mind how do I keep the terrain generation efficient um, so that the server can do that. But on the other hand, it could be the case that you also like, well, the dynamically generated terrain, the server has certain limits, but if you just pick the 4,000 by 4,000 fixed terrain, then that and the server 64 bit, so it can just have it all loaded into memory all the time, then the player counts go up significantly, and that would be fine. Like if that's, uh, yeah, there's no specific problem I'm trying to solve here. It's just one of those, um, a lot of the times you hear about how something works and I have the reaction of it doesn't seem like it should be that hard sort of you know I don't know you know why does 32-bit Minecraft only render out um, a, a max distance of 256 when I'm in 32-bit rendering a max distance of 1200 well partly it's because it's Java and their OpenGL capabilities in Java are limited um, but uh, partly I think it's just not um, well implemented, well designed, well, you know, there's the programming there is not as good as it could be. And so, you know, that's, <clears throat> there's always sometimes for me a goal of sort of maxing things out. And so, you know, like I was talking before about the shadows, like in trying to really push the triangle count the, as high as I can with an eye towards large view distance, I hate to then sacrifice that triangle count back to doing shadows, even though obviously with shadows it'll look a lot nicer. Um, 
But as always with OBBG, the goals here are, are to be flexible, to, to support many directions. And so, as I was saying, like I'm comfortable with the idea that maybe the high player counts are only with a static world and that then boils down to just trying to make that part be fast. Um, you know, and I have no idea what that involves. I, I've not spent any time or thought about it, but you, looking at what we've done so far, the obvious things are that the collision detection needs to be made efficient. Um, the current walking physics does a lot of these probes, and is that the best way to do it? Um, the old voxel engine that I did with this, everything was actually in fixed point because you need to convert between fractional coordinates and voxel coordinates a lot. You want to take some fractional coordinates, say which voxels does this overlap, and look them up in arrays, and so it's a float to integer conversion, which has in the past sometimes been slow. And in VC6, it certainly still generates a bad code for doing that. Although, you know, eventually I'll be compiling this with other compilers that aren't as slow. Um, so, uh, uh, der, der, der. I've already lost what my thread of, I just went and looked at the chat and now I forgot what I was talking about. Um, so, oh yeah, yeah, the, the fixed point coordinates. So that was how ZMC worked and which is the previous voxel engine that I was working on. And I don't know that it's necessary to go that far, but I could certainly go back and change all this to use fixed point if I felt like that was what it took to get high player counts. I would make that change, absolutely. Uh, but hopefully it won't go that far. I mean, the, the advantage of fixed point uh, is that as long as you're using floats, you know, floats only have 23 bits of precision. I guess they have 24. They're what? 1, 8, 23. So because there's an implicit leading one bit, they get the 24 bits of mantissa. And uh, what that means is as you get further from the origin, you get less precision. So you end up, you know, if you're at 65536, uh, that takes 16 bits to represent. So you only get uh, 8 bits here of precision. So in the fixed point stuff that I was doing, I have 32 bits and I would do the, actually the same thing. I would only get 8 bits of precision within the voxels. Uh, but that let you get up to 2 to the 24. Uh, your, your, you know, a single voxel coordinate could get, actually, it's plus or minus 2 to the 23, I guess. Uh, and it would just, <clears throat> before you hit the edge of the world, and it would just have full precision out there. So the thing you can do to, if you, the problem here is that you get more precision when you're close, but as you get further away, the precision goes down. So, you know, once you're at 2 to the 20, now you only have, uh, so this is the fractional bits is that. So now you only have, you know, 1 16th. Um, and you can see the guy who's walking to the Farlands in Minecraft, uh, Kurt J. Mack on YouTube, Farlands are bust. Uh, you can see how the world is very jittery because he's now gotten so far that he's into something like this area, the 1 16th or 1 8th precision. Um, and, you know, the way to combat that if you're using floats is to use doubles so that you have way more precision far away from the origin. But I don't want to use doubles everywhere for performance reasons. And you can do stuff where you don't use doubles everywhere. You use doubles for the core coordinates and then you switch to a local reference frame and use floats. And that may be how it has to get done in the long run. But again, since I only really care about uh, high player counts, on a small terrain, a, a relatively limited terrain, um, I could don't really care about how that works. Um, I guess that doesn't, I have to write the code once. I don't want to write the code twice. Once fast code for small terrain and once the slow code for large terrain. So never mind. All right, so these are all the things that these things have to do uh, of the things that we're currently doing. Um, once we add more features, uh, which things have to get done where may change. I don't know. Or maybe not. Maybe this is really all the server ever is really responsible for doing. 
<clears throat> so, what do we have to do? So the, the interesting part of networking is the communication between these two, but I can't actually do that until I've actually split these. And the splitting is what's going to take a while and is why I don't think this is going to be that interesting a task is because I'm not going to actually get to that interesting communication stuff because I, I first need to split this, uh, keep the single player client, split this and have them communicate in the single player client directly without using networking just to refactor it into what I can do the networking on. Uh, so that may take a while. Uh, so, dur, 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 what do we do? So how do we do this refactoring? So one thing is that the current caches that I have need to be made explicit about whether they're the client cache or the server cache. Uh, and as I was talking about the need to share that, it would be nice to share the generation and it would be nice to share the caches. But I think that might be too hard. So I think what I'm going to try to do is share the generation, but not share the caches. So the first step of that is to make the mesh building really separate from the rendering. Currently, it's a little bit driven by the rendering, I think. Um, get the next built mesh. Get from Q non blocking. No, I guess that's okay. That's already split out. Well, okay, so yeah. So the thing right now is that the client and the server kind of need to be able to issue independent requests. Now, for a single player, they are going to share all the requests, so they don't need to generate independent requests, but eventually they will. So do I need to actually fix something there? I'm not sure. Um, basically, the problem is like, so they you get this return thing, and you get this data out of the queue, and you need to do two different things with it. You need to hand it to the client, and you need to hand it to the server. And if those are separate threads, that's going to kind of be a pain. The other thing is, what do we do with this? Oh, that's the built mesh. That's the other thing. That's not the gen chunk. That's the mesh. Although it has the physics data in it. But that's sort of an accidental hack. I don't know I wanna, that I want to rely on that in the networking. But maybe I can. So if uh, there's no reason that the server and the client need to be separate threads in the single player. In single player, you can just sit here and alternate the server and the client. And that may be cleaner. Um, you know, it's not going to be an effect, as an effective use of threads uh, if, you know, of multi-core if there's useful work they could be doing independently. But... Uh, I think at least to start with, that may be a cleaner way to go. So, so we start by refactoring the server and the client to be independent data structures. They don't share any data directly, but they are still called from the same thread. So when we do this get next built mesh right here, we can say um, client is that server save as server physics data and then the client can do all that stuff which implies that all the current data structures are only client data structures which I'm fine with so let's rename all the current data structures um, so I think that's called replace is my command for that yeah so let's mesh Cache, cache chunk cache x and y is going to become let's use the old 
quake thing of saying C underscore for client and S underscore for server. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Remember I said early on I have no idea what's a good idea for this stuff or not. Uh, so let's... Do I have a recursive version of this? I guess I don't. I guess I have at work I made a recursive version, but I haven't done it here. So all right, it's fine. Though, all the sources here. Do that for Y. And then replace mesh chunk mesh cache with client mesh cache. And then what other data structures do we have? Oh yeah, we have all these. Size. Yeah, the thing is like, uh, this is a thing that uh, is on token boundaries. Um, so I have to actually do all these variants by hand. And of course, it's going to turn out that like the mesh chunk. Oh yeah, the mesh chunk size I don't want to change. It's only the cache. Darn it. All right, let's make sure it still builds so that I didn't accidentally rename anything to the same thing as something else. Okay, good. to see what comments were here. Or is the entire thing just talking about this other person's thing? Nothing that I care about. Uh, all right, so these ones I have to change. Um, so that's mesh chunk cache x log two. X chunk cache x log two c underscore. Let's do it for y. Let's make sure it builds again, because I'm so likely to typo something here. I want to uh, check that in. Uh, renaming, and then mesh chunk x for world chunk x for world x. C mesh chunk X. Oh, darn it. Mesh chunk X for world X. Oops. Becomes C mesh chunk X for world X. What a terrible name. Um. Alright, so that hopefully is all of that stuff. Alright. And cache radius. Maybe it only appears in that file. Two. Yep. All right. So that's that stuff. What else do we have that is client only? We have another. We have the gen chunk cache. But the gen chunk cache, we'll say, is part of 
So what we're going to do is we're going to have three conceptual processes here. Uh, the chunk generator, uh, the terrain generator. And obtain gen chunk cache. Uh, generate gen chunks. And currently, it actually does the meshing as well. Convert gen rated terrain to meshes, which means this is no longer this guy's job. And it's going to trigger generating the train for rendering, but it's not going to actually do it. We'll just leave that for now. <clears throat> and these, this does live in a separate thread, whereas these don't. So this guy, these guys can actually share data structures because they're in the same thread if I want. This guy, which means that whole thing I just did with making that mesh, nah, it's going to have to be different, so that's fine. This guy makes its own data structures in its own and accesses it from its own threads. So uh, as long as the other guy never touches GenChunk, which I think is true. sure if VC6 has an option to compile in C. Um, of course it does. It dates from 1998 when C++ was becoming popular, but certainly not as popular as it is today. This is back when they actually took the C compiler seriously. Uh, so, yeah. So now, you see these are static to this file, and this file is owned by what I called the terrain generation responsibility. So we're going to say that this is the mesh builder process. I need a better name for that. Both server and clients are clients of this. That's terrible. Are customers of this process. So, the server needs to maintain some kind of data structure. How is this going to work? The server just needs to keep physics data right now. So let's just go ahead in the server. Define um, uh, let's just hard code this for now. Too, though. What did I call these? What was the terminology for this? Gee, yeah, I just cash X, okay. I wish you could set auto repeat better, more fine grained. It's, auto repeat is really not very good in Windows for programming. 
Um, so include obbg h. I think that includes obbg data. So then we have a mesh chunk, which has a fizz chunk. So let's go ahead and just use mesh chunks for now. Mesh chunk um, server is cache. Cache y s six cache x. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to say. Static int. Um, I'm just going to call them player x and player y for now. This is the idea is that the physics cache is going to maintain data centered around the player, so we need to know where the player is to know how to update the cache. So then we say avoid server. Um, process mesh chunk and if it's near the player player bounds update it so um derp 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 uh Go ahead and put this in. Oh, we really don't have very many public functions yet, do we? Uh, and then the whole point of this is that for now, it's just, you know, leaves with the render. So here we do, we say s, whatever that function was, process mesh chunk vm.mc. So now the server <coughs> and the client both are seeing all the meshes they built. Now the server still needs to request them um, because it's going to keep a different size cache from the client and it's going to have to force it to build some that the client doesn't need, which I mentioned before is a terrible idea because then we end up generating more chunks, but whatever. We'll do it that way and see what happens. <coughs> Again, this is all kind of hackery because the, eventually the player, the server needs to support multiple players, obviously, <coughs> and this will all need to work in a different way. But again, we're just trying to refactor from what we've got to what we want. So, um, so MC chunk X. So, what do we do? This the player int p player chunk x is there's a macro for that no because the because uh, this is a different set of macros so I shouldn't use this macro although it would actually work because it's not actually dependent on the cache size it's only dependent on the chunk size which is always going to be the same so I didn't actually need to climbify this so we can't actually use this. Um, so let's actually do that, even though, even though their name is wrong. Um, not MC chunk X, player X. And we could catch this, but we don't care. All right, so. Um, if, let's see, chunk X, Greater than equal PCX minus S physics cash X over two and MC chunk X is less than PCX plus S physics cash 
x over 2. So if it's in with it within the square around it, Cache. This is player cache. Player chunk x chunk y. So I just have to use words here, otherwise, it's going to get too confusing. Player. Oops. Uh, and then fizz. Chunk fizz cash x equals let me see chunk x and s physics cash x minus one. We don't even check what's currently in that slot. We're just going to overwrite it. Uh, fizz cash and right, let's just. Chunk asterisk fizz cash chunk equals address of fizz cash cash y fizz cash x let me see chunk x equals let me see chunk x actually we just copy it pc mc equals mc uh, we don't care about a lot of the data that's in here, but rather than bother to explicitly zero it out, I'm not. I'm not actually going to zero it out. All I care about is the fizz cache and the chunk in that. Well, so let's be explicit about that since I know that's true. Let's only copy the data we care about. It might be more robust to just copy it all because then in the future when I add stuff, it'll go. But I think this is all still kind of hacked, so it's probably what a terrible what a terrible line. Look at that. It totally makes no sense. Let's let's rename PCMC because of that. PCMC is fizz cash MC. And then Chunk. <clears throat> All right, so there we go. Now we're keeping a little square around the player with physics data. How big is that square? It's eight chunks, so four in each four, a radius of four around the player, and each of those chunks is sixty-four. So four times sixty-four is two hundred fifty-six. So we're keeping a pretty good region around the player, but not nowhere near as far as we render. I don't even know if that code is actually really getting called, and if it is getting called, what it's doing. We never set the player x, y, so that part won't work. Uh, and we're not telling it to rebuild that stuff, so it doesn't actually manage to store data. So let's add a visualizer so we can actually see that. Um, what's a good way to visualize this? Uh, I think we'll just store, because it's small enough. It's what, eight by eight? Which is what, 256 numbers? That's maybe kind of too big. You can make it smaller. But if that's so small, it, eh. Um, so, update. Server hash feedback. And we'll do that here too. 
update server cache feedback. And the job of this is to set some global variables that we can print out. So, um, what we're going to do is Store this data into this global variable. What is that called? Is that the right name? Mesh chunk size x log two. Right, and I'm only doing that on left shifts. On right shifts, if it's a left shift, I'm sticking with times plus minus player X. So this is telling us where the cache, where the thing is relative to the player, assuming we ever call that function which we don't currently so let's add that real quick to voxel render so we'll just do it with the camera right here and x cam y and what else do I need to do need to display it, do I, but did I do everything I needed to do here? I think I did. Um, here I start cache feedback. Main. Where we print. Here's where we print. Print. Um, percent 4D, percent 4D. Uh, I'm not printing both X and Y. I don't even know what that's printing. So has this in the address? So probably just garbage. I don't know. Uh, 
Don't know if that's gonna be readable enough. Yeah, my, my space character is not the same width as the digits. And maybe the minus character isn't also, which causes this stuff to not quite line up. Um, okay, so that's a little hard to tell what's going on. So I think what I want to do is um, code this differently. I want to use minus player x the same thing here. I want to just measure them in chunk offsets rather than measure them in coordinate offsets because I don't get enough value out of using world coordinates for that. Okay, now when I move around, just when I cross a chunk boundary, it'll update. Am I sending the player X, player Y? I thought it was. Oh, there it goes. And now you can see I'm getting pretty far away. It should always, because I'm not actually telling it to generate these things. So what it wants to do is always be center around zero, zero. That's not working, actually. Um, why is that? That was wrong, but that didn't matter. Y, X, Y. Why is it letting it go? Why? Oh, I see. It's, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. So it goes from negative 2, negative 2 up to 1, comma 1. It's just centered weird. Um, so as I move around, what should happen, but is not coded yet, is that it should always keep that zero zero somewhere on here, keep the negative two, negative two to one comma one range, um, and instead they're getting arbitrarily big, and that's because I'm not actually generating the chunks that are around it. So I need to actually generate those. Um, so we need to be able to request the chunks that are missing, which we would do here. Um, but we don't want to request a chunk we've already requested and this gets into that whole giant mess that we already have in the current requester here where we sort the list and figure out which ones we already have requested and all that stuff and I don't remember does that code live here or does that code live inside the doesn't look particularly messy I don't remember where this code lives um This is the single threaded version. No, this is the single threaded version. What is. Oh, no, they're both part of the single threaded version. Okay. How does this work? Does anyone remember? How does it decide which chunks it needs to do? Is there just a separate call somewhere? Request mesh generation. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. So we iterate over all of the chunks to build the consider list, which is prioritized. Then we put that all into a list, and then we tell the other side about that list. And what we need to do here is we need to also throw in higher priority the physics mesh requests. But they need to know about the meshes that are already requested and how do we do that? We let the other side do that. The other side says, oh, I know that mesh is already pending. So request mesh generation. See, and this will be much simpler non-single player because the server and the cache and, and the client don't have to share this process. 
Um, so, what are, what are these called? Requested meshes. So let's find requested mesh. And then this is int needs mesh because the server only wants the fizz chunks, does not actually want the meshes. So for now, consider mesh, and then oh, consider mesh is not requested mesh. R of i dot state equals dot state dot needs mesh is true um, and then mesh builder does this swap requested meshes where it processes them Get chunk status alloc. I have no idea what any of this code does anymore. Get chunk status, I understand, but what would alloc mean in get chunk status? All right, so we keep a whole separate cache. I forgot about how this works, right? There's a cache of what ones we're processing. But now the problem is that they we have two kinds of requests. Like if we requested a mesh for the physics we could have a request that says I don't need mesh geometry I just need physics data but then later after that gets requested we come back in with a new request which is now I need the mesh data oh oh I hate this stuff any of this stuff for me I see a huge amount of conversation that's not for me um, do do prefix stuff at me because currently that conversation has gone far afield from OBBG <coughs> which is fine I'm not complaining just So if we get two requests like this, we kind of the easiest thing to do in one sense is to just serve them separately. But the problem is that we have this whole mesh cache um, mesh chunk status. Cache. All right. And uh, we can't really have two things because we assume that they're I guess I could make that have a third dimension. I mean, the obvious thing that you want to do is that if you get a needs mesh request and you already have a pending request that doesn't need mesh, you want to replace it. And that's just gross because this is all threaded. Um, 
summary of the current problem is we have a client and we have a server and in single player they are running together possibly on the same thread and share the mesh builder and the mesh builder builds terrain geometry and then takes that terrain geometry and uh, builds uh, meshes, triangle meshes, and builds physics data. And when the client and the server are sharing it, the server only needs the physics data and the client needs both the physics and the mesh data. Uh, so it would be nice if when the physics, uh, when the server part requests a chunk and it only needs a physics, it would be nice if the system did not go ahead and build the mesh data and then I have to throw it away because building the mesh data is inefficient. Um, and the server is doing, the server requesting this physics data is making us do extra work beyond what the work we're currently doing in the single player version in the single player version under the model that I'm talking about, the thing will be doing extra work. So it would be nice if it didn't have to generate this th data that gets thrown away. But that now means there are two different kinds of mesh chunk requests, ones that want triangle data and ones that don't. And although it would not normally happen, you could get in the situation where the server requests and the client both request the same chunk. One of them requests it with uh, server with mesh data and one requests it not with mesh data and if they come in in the wrong order you would end up uh, the two requests are currently I just added a flag to distinguish those requests but the way the system keeps track of pending requests doesn't have any facility for dealing with that uh, and there is no good way to make sure that um, to, to deal with what happens when you get two of those requests at the same time. You don't currently ever get two requests at the same time because it sees that there is already a pending request and discards the new request. But that is not the right thing to do anymore if the old request said, I don't need triangle data, and the new request says, I do need triangle data. Then you can't just discard the new request. So you need to discard the old request or replace it with the, the other thing. And that's all possible. It's just a pain because it's all threading gobbledygook. That is the summary. <clears throat> which is not short. Which is like exactly what, you know, back when I wrote this whole the this thing, uh, not worker manager, the swap requested meshes. This was the big painful thing back when I was doing the threading and it is painful uh, and people were like, okay, wait, what is the problem? Why is this so hard? And the problem takes a long time to explain uh, because it is actually a hard problem. And yes, I jump straight to the hard problem when I do these things um, because, yeah, I, I mean, even just making it so that the two requests are independent is itself a pain. I'd have to change the way we track pending things to add a third dimension, mesh status. I would now need a third dimension of whether you requested the stuff or not. Um, and that would propagate all the way through everyone that uses this data structure. You would need to know about that. Um, and why are these four by four? Oh, right. That's the stuff within. Uh, and then if I were later to performance optimize it, I would have to put all that stuff back. So it seems kind of dumb to not just do it the correct way initially. But it is not clear what the correct way to do is. I can make the request happen at the same time. The problem is that the server may decide it needs it this frame and the client doesn't decide it needs it till some number of frames in the future. It shouldn't, this shouldn't ever actually happen the way things currently work, uh, but I don't 
I, I need to handle, like, that specific case shouldn't actually come up when I'm just having them both process a square around the player, but I don't want to put build in the system that actually has that lurking bug when I later go and change how they, what their policy for what they're keeping track of is. How much stuff would I have to change if I just treat them as separate requests? Mesh status has to get a third dimension. So let's see how many places use that. So get chunk status needs to take another dimension. Get chunk status alloc needs to take another dimension. That is some debugging. That's the only one for that. Get chunk status, who uses that? No wait, get chunk status is for mesh chunks. Wait, isn't that for gen chunks? I'm confused. No, that's for mesh chunks. I don't understand what this code is doing. What is a mesh chunk status? Oh, right. It tracks that. Right. It caches that. It has no, it can't be asynchronously updated, but it caches it. Yep. Okay. Right. So this would have to look at requested mesh state that would come in. Get chunk status there. I guess that can be done. It's going to involve changing like 10 or 20 places. Um, so this is only talking about right now, I'm not worrying, this is not a problem once you have a separate server and a separate client. This is only for single player where the client and the server are running in the same process. Um, so yeah, no, none of those questions actually have any bearing on the actual problem. Um, for what I know that's not a very productive or helpful comment there but um, you are misunderstanding what the actual problem is so uh, um, yeah I guess I can just go ahead and do that it's sucky because I'm going to have to back it out probably at some point and it's definitely not needed once you're actually multi-threading but just let it break where it breaks. Uh, this one is by bool need mesh. We shouldn't call it mesh, should we? Because we're calling it a mesh chunk. And it's the meaning of mesh chunk is overloaded. That's part of why this is so terrible, because this meaning is already so overloaded. Needs triangles, let's call it. Needs triangle mesh is the intended meaning, but let's just call it that for now. Um, bull needs triangles. Needs triangles. And this one has to actually check that. No, it doesn't have to check that. Yes, I. Ha yes, I have a job. The, uh, the the problem is that I didn't want to do the good that I'm doing right now. This seemed a dumb way to do this. Um, look at me iterating through true and false by going from zero to k. 
Would that be better to go false to less than equal to true? What a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. Uh, I'm just blindly assuming all this stuff is going to be correct. Without me writing any more code. I have no idea if that's true. At least they all have the right variable handy. Uh, I don't even know why I had that in there. All right. Oh, because I was going to start generating. Right, so now I need to actually generate those requests and um, let's just do static. Let's do this. Um, what are they called? Requested meshes? I don't remember. Requested mesh. Turn the number requested, and we'll just request them all. So the x coordinate we need is player cx minus s physics cache x over 2 plus i. Plus j. And arm of n dot state equals, I think that's ignored, and needs triangles is false. All right. Do, 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 do. So, there's our completed function. Yeah, that bull oop lick, icks me out too. That's one of the m several reasons why I didn't really want to do this this way. Alright, so now request mesh generation will make that handle this. Max, what is R? Where is RM? Is that all oh, right? <clears throat> so that's now uh, 
RM max build meshes. This takes cam X to cam Y. And uh, so you can see how this is has almost nothing to do with uh, with actually doing multiplayer, which is why I said this was going to be kind of boring. It's because I'm trying to solve all the, these problems to do with having a separate server and client in the same thing efficiently. Like if they both just built their own terrain generation totally independently, this wouldn't be a problem. But of course, to have them do that, given that I already have all this, this mesh builder system that was global, uh, would actually have been a pain. Although I guess I could have done it on its own thread. I guess the server could have just built things directly instead of going through the mesh builder. Um, so that does that, and that gives us M, and then we say I equals zero and N and M less than max built meshes. And the state has to be RMS requested, actually. In. And let's see what I've forgotten to do. Object server cache feedback redefinition. Oh, I have to make curly close curly braces. Okay, that built. No idea what it does. Um so now for now, we're having them ex do things explicitly, so... Um, okay, it should not request the mesh if it already has it. So this should be int rx equals that, and ry equals that. Right, I'm pretty sure that's how this works. If we have the mesh chunk, then we don't put it in concerted mesh. So yeah, if we already have it, we don't request it. That makes sense. So here we need to say if we already have it, if server cache, uh, we need to do the same thing. Not server cache feedback anyway. It's fizz cache. So. Ry and S physics dash x minus one y rather Rx and S physics dash x minus one. So if we already have it, <coughs> which of course we need void init physics cache. This is a server function. I come J for this. Make sure we end this so it won't be valid. If is cache of J of I dot chunk x equals I plus one. It's never valid. And we gotta call that. Where are our nits? Nit chunk caches. Oh, sorry, what was that one? S init fizz cache fizz chunk. What did I call it? Physics cache. Of course. That was sarcastic, of course, in case you couldn't tell. Um, okay, so then now we built it. Okay, so now when we get in here, we can say if fizz cache mc arrow chunk 
x does not equal rx or is cache mc chunk y does not equal ry, then we need to generate the request. Uh, Alright, so that all maybe works, and then when we come back from here, did I do this? Right, M didn't do that. M, 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 M. And then here, when it comes back, we want if bm dot let's see has triangles. Then it's for the server, else it's for the client. And then I'll let that find my has triangles definition. There we go. And has triangles. So now we need to actually set has triangles and not generate the mesh data and all that stuff. So that goes in mesh builder. So mesh builder. I think it's worker manager. Generate terrain. So can start proc gen. Is that the only place we do that? Probably. Start proc gen. Let's see what that does. Proc gen in progress. Oh, so right, there's a separate cache for that. Um, Right, so that's this spot. So if some chunk set wasn't valid and it became valid, wait, proc, oh, proc gen, generate train. So I know this is where we did. Okay, gosh. Once we have 16 valid chunks, then we're ready to go. So we say, uh, all that and then we say if rm needs triangles then we have to start another process that does all that stuff if rm does not need triangles however we're actually done so now we have to go see job build mesh see how it deals with cleanup at the end so here's the and when it's done it adds to the queue built meshes so let's look at how the cube built meshes is dealt with. Get next built mesh. Is that called directly by the thing? I think it is. It is. Oh, right. It's a get built mesh, not a thing. Okay, right. So, uh, so we look at where that gets generated again. Add to queue built meshes. Out mesh MC has all this other data. So the main thing is that it has a mesh chunk that got malloced. All right, so basically what we want to do is instead of starting a new process here, we want to do some small subset of this. We get a mesh chunk, we set the mesh chunk coordinates. We uh, need an out mesh. No, I just copy that. Did I delete it after I copied it? I guess I did. Out mesh. These are going to be null. So I probably don't even need to set them. 
Oh, but it's going to try to clean them up. So yeah, they probably do need to be. Once we're done, we do that. So where do we make the physics? Probably in generate mesh for chunk set. Build this chunk. Okay, does this actually use any of this data here? I don't think it does. So let's... do that so this is WC I don't do I have a WC I think I got to find yeah so those. what is T T is a task which gets built right here so it's just those okay RMX RMY. Uh, chunks. Chunks is not the right name. Where did chunks come from? that thing again or not generate terrain built mesh rather so where does chunks come from uh, there is no chunks here right build, build fizz chunk oh that's just the chunk set right yep chunk set okay so that's part of, we just built this thing. So the MCS chunks at valid refers to, MCS T, so this t.cs, t.cs. I don't know if I need to take the address of that. Yeah, I do. Okay, I think that's it. Mesh is zero, and then we can release the chunks. Pump mesh of MC is MC. Cue it. These don't need to get freed. We don't need to wake them that because that's part of the other thing. Probably crash. Build this chunk. MC is allocated. MC chunk is set. Chunks looks okay. MC PC column does not. Y off, X off. Where do those get built? Are those separately allocated? Uh, MC Alex. Um, fizz chunk, build fizz column, should alloc itself, gen chunk, seems like it's valid, I guess it's not valid though. X, Y, Z, yeah that's pretty valid. GC arrow partial. GC. Is GC not valid? IJ chunks. Oh, that's interesting. This is forcing it to build chunks it doesn't need. It's forcing it to build 4x4 four four and it only needs a 2x2. Two two. So that will be something to change eventually. Okay, so we have a bunch of chunks. Those seem fine. But when we went to access this, which chunk is that?
chunks of j, chunks of chunk of j of i. Yeah, this looks bogus. Why is that bogus? We tried to use t.cs, which is mcs error cs. Update the state. Um, let's just run it again in case somehow that changed. Hey, look, it was probably reissuing the same thing. Okay, so this is clearly wrong because that table on the left has totally wrong data. Uh, and I don't know if it's updating or not. All right, so um, not sure how those can be totally wrong like that. Let's go ahead and, and uh, check what we've currently got. And just to be on the safe side, Messages since I've been doing this for a while. Okay. Um, so uh, we're getting the server cache call back here, and the Y coordinates don't seem right. So am I like? And they used to be right. I mean, they're all wrong, but the Y coordinates are more clearly broken. Um, right, they're all. The Y coordinates are all changing at the same time, and the X coordinates seem to be ignoring one of the. It might be the same property, right? The X coordinates should only vary along the X, and the Y coordinates should vary along the Y. So, the, some kind of bug with the Y coordinates, which seems odd because this code should or this code should mean it can only update one of the slots so I don't know how it can update the other slots okay so let's make sure this is still doing the right thing so j sub i so j sub i chunk y minus player y yeah I think the feedback is valid it's showing us what it's supposed to show so then the question is See, even if I were requesting the wrong thing here, which is certainly possible, it shouldn't get written back into the cache. The fact that the cache used to work makes this really odd. Of course, the cache used to work being fed the old data. I mean, sort of pseudo work. So what happens if we do this? And we're also not freeing it. Uh, free mesh chunk. We don't free it in this path because we store it. Um, is that how it's called? Mesh chunk free, free. What do we do when we. What's it called? Set mesh chunk. lives in mesh builder which I should move out free mesh chunk oh is it not global
No, it's global. Free mesh chunk. What was the actual error? Undefined. But not in this. I guess it's not in this. expect this to still yeah now I switched it back to the old thing and it should just do what the old thing does and there's a bug with the physics chunk request overwrote the render request even though it shouldn't have because they're supposed to be separate but it obviously caused some kind of problem that made the physics the render thing break and this looks like we may have to use the wrong chunk here for at least some of this because this stuff no longer meets correctly does that happen anywhere else? Yeah, that's broken out there. So we broke the mesh chunk rendering, the mesh chunk processing in other ways. That looks wrong as well. Yeah, so there's some kind of thread race condition and oh, this could be an out of memory or this could be a bug. Are we not cleaning up our chunks correctly? Yeah, we don't free the chunks probably. No, we do. Release gen chunks. We do it right here. Um, out mesh. We don't set that flag. What was the flag? I don't even remember what the flag was. Oh, it has triangles. That would probably be good to to do correctly, so we don't accidentally receive a mesh that has no triangles and try to process that by the uh, this thing. So that should fix that. Is it still causing? Yeah, there's still, we're still having some kind of bug here with. It's getting the wrong chunk data somehow. Or the wrong meshes. No, wrong chunk data, I think. The mesh it's, looks like it's seamless. Seamlessly built from the wrong chunk data. Um, and now we're back to the physics being broken, but now we can switch the physics call here back to where it was and see if that works for physics data. No, now this is still that busted data here in that the matrix that's being displayed at the top left, still totally busted. So we're not requesting the right data and then somehow when we process it, we're s allowing it to be set wrong, which I still don't understand how that could happen. Um, so I guess I should check here. Wait, I hadn't even hit this code yet. It was wrong. Um, oh wait, so it doesn't seem to actually be updating. Are we requesting? We are requesting. We're requesting 16 meshes, which is all the meshes around us, because they're all wrong. And then this is requesting a whole bunch more meshes. Oops, I meant to step in. I think it's that initial data there is the initial data that I said is always invalid. That's what that is showing. That's why those numbers are all the same. 
Yeah. So like one of them got updated, but the one, two, three, fours should be zero, one, two, three. So that's just showing that invalid data state. And which means this is never getting called with useful data. Looks like one is getting called. One, there's one getting updated. M dot MC chunk X dot MC or chunk Y. Well, that isn't good. Why is that not correct? Mesh builder. We're setting it here. Oh, we set it from T. Let's uninitialize. Why do we initialize this task outside of this? I don't know. I don't think we need to. I think this should go in here. And then we can't accidentally reference it. Still broken. All right. So, is that world X or is that chunk X? I thought that was maybe chunk X. Except it's being multiplied here. But why are these called C? They're not chunks. Yep, okay, those are world chords. CX and CY are world chords, and they're just RMX is unscaled. So RMX and RMY must be. Uh, so that should be right. Um, build fizz chunk maybe takes chunk words it takes world chords and doesn't actually ever use them anywhere it looks like um, what we're getting here. Come see our chunk X. Come see our chunk Y. The same coordinate multiple times. Yeah, it's just they only tried to generate four of them. Which you can see in the are the four corners of the matrix. Actually have the correct coordinates in them. I guess what I should do to make this even easier to visualize is have this just store the chunk coordinates instead of offsetting them relative to the player. In the long run, offsetting them relative to the player will make more sense, but in the short term, this will let me move around and see whether they update at all or not, or if that was just me, yeah. So I'm not requesting the correct coordinates. I'm only requesting two by two around the player. It looks like. There is cache X and Y. So we're one shift that, so that's four. This was 16, right? Let's look at what we requested. RM. Q 
negative two, negative one, zero, one, one, one. Yeah, that looks plausible. Certainly it's requesting out to negative two. So then the question is why when it generates them, these coordinates were coming out Wait, I'm setting chunk coordinates in the requested mesh. Is that correct? World coordinates. Hopefully this all works and we are correctly generating around the player. So we'll see if this update as I move. Yep, okay. Correctly generating around the player some physics data. We're doing it a little bit inefficiently um, because we generate the same data twice and the way it's generating is a lot more around it but finally got all that working how long did that take it's now 920 so i didn't start on this right away but it's been two hours since i started the stream almost um so finally this there is room for now the physics to have uh, a separate physics cache on the server and so we'll be able to run the physics separately on the server and the client. Um, and you may remember that the physics is all designed to pass stuff in and then calls gather collision geometry. And so in a traditional client server, we would have the client and the server, the implementation of gather collision geometry would access different things. But in single player where the client and the server on the same machine those are going to actually need to know which machine it is so maybe I'll have to pass into this um, some kind of context handle that's used for gathering the collision geometry and it'll use that um, and of course initially the server and the client will just generate the exact same data all the time it won't actually be possible to see any deviation so I'll have to introduce some kind of intentional mismatch between the client and the server so that the authoritative server will override the client. But I think I'm going to stop there. Like I said, didn't really actually get to any networking at all. Um, just started teasing apart some of the stuff that is combined. Probably the hardest individual thing here that need to be teased apart. Everything else is already more or less ready to go run separately um, so probably next time uh, oh I forgot to put this up so probably next time I'll be able to actually start working on running the physics separately in the server and the client uh, and I still won't do it networked it'll still just they'll just communicate directly but I'll go ahead and have them do it in a single player you don't really necessarily want to work that way you probably just want the server the client to just always use the servers thing but I'll go ahead and implement it that way explicitly um, before trying to actually send that da data over the network just so that we can see that it's synchronized uh, or see that they're doing the same thing uh, so what did I do in the same today's stream refactor mesh generation so single player client and server can share the threaded workers all right so yeah that's it uh and i will look at questions in chat thanks for watching